Good morning, McNabb. Thanks for joining us for worship this morning. Let's begin by listening to our gathering band sing, Mighty to Save. gathering band, let us join together and sing the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, choir. Good morning, friends. I hope everyone has had some fun in the snow this week, and I hope that you were able to stay nice and cozy during the cold weather. Before we get into Kid Zone, I want to wish Jared McCarthy a very happy birthday. He's celebrating today. Happy birthday, Jared. We think you're great. If you have a birthday, I would love to celebrate with you, and we all would, so please don't hesitate. I just need you to email me the Wednesday before so that we can all acknowledge and celebrate with you. All right, on to Kid Zone. Last week, we talked about when we imagine the worst case scenario. And this week, I want to talk to you about thinking the worst, but in a different kind of way. Have you ever had a time where you had a really good day, but maybe one little thing went wrong and that one little thing made you feel like the whole day was bad? I know that happens to me sometimes. There could be a hundred good things and one bad thing. And sometimes I focus on the one bad thing. And I tend to forget about all the other good things that happened. And I think that's very common for a lot of people. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. It's natural to focus on the negative. But I want to encourage you when you feel yourself thinking that you're leaning on those negative thoughts to say, stop. And think about the good things that happened and focus on those instead. 
things are always going to go wrong, unfortunately. Some days are going to be perfect, but more often than not, sometimes something's going to happen that you're not planning on. You might be late. You might have dropped your favorite mug and broken it. Your brother or sister may have bumped the table and the beautiful artwork that you were working on got a big smudge in it. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong and it's really easy to focus on those. But instead, I want you to focus on the blessings. Focus on all the wonderful things that God has done for you. Maybe it's that you got to talk on the phone with your grandma or grandpa, or maybe you got to go for a hike and you saw a friend, or maybe while you were hiking, you found the most perfect pine cone you've ever found, whatever it is, there's always lots of good things. And there's usually one good thing that you can focus on. And I want to encourage you to find that one thing and focus on the blessings instead of the negative. And when you do, I want you to thank God for all the wonderful things that he has provided for you. That's it for me for today. Judy is going to share with us before she reads today's scripture. Thanks, Christina, and good morning, McNabb. Prior to coming to McNabb Street Presbyterian Church, my family and I have been attending church for well over 20 years. Our faith has been an important part of our lives. Ken and I were married in the Presbyterian Church, raised our children, and continue to be a part of this faith community. We moved to McNabb over five years ago. Steve had already had an incredible impact on our faith and our lives. So we made the decision to follow him to McNabb. The congregation at McNabb was warm and welcoming. We have enjoyed our time at McNabb as we have made new friends and became reacquainted with old ones. Steve has an incredible way of presenting the scripture that is very powerful and easy to understand. We love hearing the choir at her traditional service as well as the praise band at gathering. My favorite service of the entire year is the carols by candlelight. We are thankful that we can still gather virtually each week, but we really look forward to when we can all meet again in person. As we continue our series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, let's begin reading in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. This morning, as we consider this fourth component of patience, let's also hear James' word, words on endurance, which is also translated to patience in some versions. Reading from James 1, 2 to 4. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Thanks very much, Judy. Patience. The ability to calmly endure the hardship of waiting for something we want but don't yet have. And that can involve a wide spectrum of applications. Some of us lack patience standing in front of the microwave. Others, if we end up three back in the queue at the grocery store, maybe waiting for the results of a job interview, maybe medical test results, or maybe we're waiting for God to make things right in a world where circumstances seem senseless at best and cruel at their worst. Maybe it feels to us like things could never be made right. This past week, I watched the movie Shadowlands. It's a story of C.S. Lewis's marriage to Joy Grisham and the agony that he experienced in losing her to cancer. And in a scene near the end of the movie, after Joy had died, Lewis returned to his friends who tried to co console him. One of them says, only God knows why these things have to happen. And Lewis, with his emotions exposed and raw, erupts. God knows, but does God care? That same depth of feeling utterly perplexed comes up in the Psalms. In Psalm 13, verse 2, the psalmist cries, How long, Lord? 
Will you utterly forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? Patience is needed in these moments of deepest despair, but also when facing day-to-day -day inconveniences. In either case, how does this fruit of patience unfold? This fruit of the Holy Spirit that I've said repeatedly doesn't just magically appear without explanation, but reflects the outcome of our participation. And the passage from James that Judy read for us highlights the active role that we are to have in experiencing patience. This idea is captured in the word endurance. It appears in James and is another angle from which we understand this idea of patience. In fact, different versions use the word interchangeably. The version Judy read for us used the word endurance. Listen to how the King James says it. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Patience here flows from the testing of your faith through trials that are mentioned in verse 2. What kind of trials? Some would suggest the trials of spiritual persecution, being picked on for your faith. But what does verse 3 say? Trials of any kind. So I would suggest that they can certainly include suffering from injustice or persecution, but it might also include managing the day-to-day -day inconveniences that frustrate us as well. There's something here in this passage for all of us. And James helps us focus on the active part that we are to play in developing patience. The Greek word that James uses is the word hupomene, and it's a different word from what Paul uses in Galatians 5, where he lists patience as one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I would liken the use of these two different words as two sides of the same coin. Galatians 5 names the outcome of patience, whereas James chapter 1 emphasizes our active participation in realizing patience. That's why translations use different words to capture these different sides. One version uses the word patience, another endurance, or steadfastness, or even perseverance. All of these shades of meaning are contained in that word hupomene in James 1. And if you were to break it down into parts, hupo means under, meno means to stay or abide or remain. And, and at its root then, hupomene means to remain under. It has the picture of someone under a heavy load and choosing to stay there instead of trying to escape. And this word goes beyond passively waiting to actively enduring. David Guzik describes it this way. It isn't so much the quality that helps you sit quietly in the doctor's waiting room as it is the quality that helps you finish a marathon. We are exhorted to choose this quality. Why? Why choose to actively endure trials of different kinds? I can think of three reasons. My first reason to patiently endure trials is because the alternative doesn't get me anywhere. When I give in to frustration, that option only takes away from me more. I look back on those times in my life where I've allowed impatience to dictate my choices, and those choices didn't make my situation better. In fact, it opened the doors for more negativity, which often snowballed. It makes my situation worse. After following the path, or maybe even better said, the detour of impatience, I either end up exactly right back where I started or even further behind. So for me, the alternative to patiently enduring doesn't move me forward. It doesn't help me. In fact, I regret it whenever I've chosen it. The second reason for choosing patient endurance is that it empowers me, empowers me to decide how I'm going to respond to my trials. In other words, when I face trials, I am not a helpless victim with no choice. Even in the most awful circumstances, do not, those, those circumstances do not get to have the ultimate power over what I choose. 
Dr. Viktor Frankl in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, unpacks this idea. And Frankl was a prisoner of war in a concentration camp during the Holocaust. And he both watched and directly experienced unthinkable atrocities and watched people in the midst of these atrocities surrender to their despair. But he also observed that others were able to persevere, endure, remain steadfast, including himself. Those who did not surrender their choice as to how they would respond. And even in the most terrible of situations, they were able to choose. Frankel says this, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. So choosing patient endurance affirms that I still have the freedom to choose my attitude, whatever circumstances I face. The third and most important reason for patient endurance is that patient endurance is, the, is at the core of living at our faith. That's the verdict of Hebrews chapter 11, where in verse one, the writer says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. In other words, what we're patiently waiting for. Verse 2 says, this is what the ancients were commended for. And then Hebrews 11 goes on to describe example after example of those ancients, that's people in the Old Testament, who patiently endured. All the way down to verse 39, where he says, though they were commended for their faith, they did not receive what was promised, or inferred not yet received what was promised. Verse 40 alludes to them looking forward to something beyond their immediate trials. And they patiently endured because they believed that their present trials did not get the final say. With them, we are invited to trust God. That the trials we are presently patiently enduring will not have the final word. In fact, Hebrews 11 teams us up with those people described throughout that chapter by saying this in verse 40. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us, they, the ancients, would be made perfect. In the context of Hebrews, that something better, something better described in verse 40, is the resurrection and new creation which Jesus secured for us. But in the meantime, we patiently endure. In the meantime, in, in the same way the stress of exercise actually strengthens our muscles physically, the stress of patiently enduring through trials strengthens us spiritually. In 1888, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche first stated, out of life's school of war, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And you may remember that Kelly Clarkson sang a song about it. It earned her best pop vocal album of the year in 2013. But in light of this morning's thoughts, the slight twist that I might offer is this. What doesn't kill me has the potential to make me stronger, depending how I choose to patiently endure. So that's why I think patiently enduring is the way to go and the path to pursue. But how do we do it? Let me finish with five suggestions that I try to keep in mind as I try to walk this path. These aren't comprehensive and please feel free to build on them. But here's five. Number one, I do not presume that life should be or will be a smooth path for me. Impatience quickly surfaces when I think life should go along smoothly and then I get frustrated when those expectations aren't met. Later in James chapter four, we are warned about not presuming a smooth path in life. He begins in verse 13 by saying, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. That sounds like presuming a smooth path, but he goes on in verse 14 to say this, yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. So don't presume a smooth path. You can't even guarantee tomorrow. Number two, in my prayers, I pray in advance for grace about whatever unknown trials are coming. 
part of my morning prayers involves reciting the Lord's Prayer. And when I get to the line that says, give us this day our daily bread, that's like me telling God that I'm depending on him for the physical nourishment that I require for the day. But why not expand that to the expectation for spiritual grace that we're going to need to patiently endure the trials of the day? Number three, remember, and I try to remember that although I cannot choose what trials may come, I can, as Viktor Frankl reminds us, choose how I respond to those trials. That is still my freedom. Number four, I need to keep in mind that I need others' help and others facing trials need my help. The very next chapter of Galatians, following this list of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, reminds us of this, bear one another's burdens and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. The New Testament was mostly written to communities, not to individuals. We're all in this together. And all of us need the support of each other as we face our trials. Number five, and above all, when I cry out to God in my trials, I need to remember that God understands the situations that require patient endurance. In the movie Forrest Gump, there's a scene where Lieutenant Dan, having lost his legs in combat, angrily says to Forrest, do you know what it's like not being able to use your legs? And Forrest, as we know from earlier in the story, had to wear leg braces much of his childhood. He says, yes, sir, I do. If we were to say to God, do you know what it's like to have to patiently endure? God's answer would be, yes, I do. In Jesus, God understands what it feels like to have to patiently endure. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, on the heels of that passage about all of the ancients who endured by faith and how we are now part of that patient endurance as well. Going into chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews exhorts us to do this in verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When we cry out to God, we cry out to one who knows what it means to have to patiently endure. And in turn, he serves as our example and our inspiration to do the same. Chapter 12, verse 3 of Hebrews concludes by saying this, consider him, that's talking about Jesus, who endured the cross patiently. Consider him who endured such evil from sinful men so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Patient endurance is not only the path we are invited to walk, but it is also the path our Savior walked ahead of us. Let's take a moment and reflect together as we listen to David Milmine sing for us, Draw Me Nearer. I long to rise in the arms of 
thanks so very much, David. Let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us, even in our trials. And Father, we pray that as we have been exhorted, that we might fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. May we be careful to consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that we may not grow weary and lose heart. Lord, we pray that we would be careful to support and strengthen one another as together we seek to patiently endure the trials before us. And Father, in that spirit, we pause at this moment to pray for someone who we know needs a touch of your grace in the trials that they are facing. And Father, we thank you that you hear us, that you help us, and that you promise that you will do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all we ask or imagine, because we have asked it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and thank you for joining us this morning. I'd like to invite you to a Zoom fellowship at 1045. You're welcome to attend. I did send out the link in this week's mailing, but if you don't have the link, write me right now, or if you want to be added to our mailing list, write me right now at mcnabstreet at gmail.com. I'll see that you get the link or are added to our mailing list. And now may the Lord go before you to lead you. May the Lord go behind you to protect you. May the Lord go beneath you to support you. May the Lord go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord together. Amen.